Climate change, the defining issue of our time, and Southeast Asia is one of the most vulnerable to its impacts. Indeed, there is an urgent need to help people navigate the complexity of climate change. And what better way to do that than storytelling? Join us as we break down how to tell stories that don't only inform, but also move people to action. This is Through the Climate Lens, a conference on climate storytelling in Southeast Asia. I am delighted to be your moderator in this important conversation today. Um, I am very pleased to be welcoming my speakers um, to just give you an idea. Um, this is a conversation that has been gaining traction over the past um, years, I would say. And I'm very um, privileged to say that Climate Tracker is the nonprofit journalism organization leading um, the nurture of journalists um, towards becoming climate advocates as well, and to support amazing climate reporting globally. Um, there is a need for us to highlight Southeast Asia's clean energy transition, and because of that, um, and particularly from a climate lens, and because of that, we are very pleased to be welcoming our speakers today. In no particular order, I'd like to introduce them to you. Dr. Muyi Yang, who is the Asia Senior Electricity Policy Analyst of Ember. Attorney Avril de Torres, who is the Deputy Executive Director of the Center for Energy, Ecology and Development. And Mr. Hans Nicholas Jong, an environmental journalist from Manga Bay, based in Jakarta. We also have Ms. or Mr. Nisi Nessa Durai, Climate Action Network Southeast Asia's Director and Regional Coordinator. I hope I got that right. Now, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat window and we'll have a Q&A after the discussion. Wonderful. So just to get the conversation rolling, I'd like to ask each of our speakers this afternoon, what do you think or how would you describe the current energy landscape in Southeast Asia and what should we expect in the next few years? Um, please allow me to start with Dr. Yang. Dr. Young, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Ping. And uh, I would say that you know the momentum towards a clean energy future has is uh, 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 is gaining. You know the transition towards a clean energy future is gaining momentum across Southeast Asia countries. But the mark, most of the efforts so far has been placed on some initiatives or programs aimed at promoting renewable projects. Mm -hmm. Now we start seeing some effort being placed on phasing down fossil fuel power plant. Include some, or some examples include JetP recently announced and, uh, and the ADB's initiatives on, uh, 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 about this uh, uh, clean energy uh, transition mechanisms. But this energy transition is much more complex than this. Imagine that a couple of initiatives or policy incentives or a, a few uh, renewable projects can deliver, can transform the whole energy sector into a clean future is an overstatement. Because the current system is built around fossil fuel power plant. And this is a complex industrial system. Once when we are moving from fossil fuels toward clean energies, that means that all the underpinning element of the existing power system needs to be uh, changed. And uh, I would say that I would expect to see more focused attention to be placed on making system-wide change in Southeast Asia. And that's, that's all from me. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Dr. Yang, for that uh, overview about uh, Southeast, the region's energy landscape and how many other elements are moving um, as we transform the way economies are powered in this um, region. I, I come to you, Hans, um, on your thoughts. How would you describe from a journalist uh, who has covered the region, the current energy landscape. 
Um, thank you very much, uh, Ping, for the question. Um, I I will answer this question based on my experience in Indonesia because uh, that that is uh, the, the the country that I'm most familiar with. So if you're asking about uh, if you're asking this question like two years ago, I would answer that, that there there hasn't been much momentum because. Um, there hasn't been um, like strong announcements coming from the government um, regarding energy transition, uh, but just within uh, this, this span of um, two years, we 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 already seeing uh, uh, you know uh, huge announcements coming from the government, which uh, I personally think is very surprising because I didn't think that it was possible um, for a country like Indonesia to be able to you know to have such a huge announcement. Especially because uh, if we see Indonesia, it's it's uh, it's, a, it's a country that very much um, uh, rely uh, on coal to to generate its electricity. So uh, if if you ask this question now, I, I will agree with uh, me that uh, it, it, there's you know huge momentum uh, going on right now. But I think uh, the question that we have to ask is uh, what will happen you know in in the coming uh, few years because. Right now, I think the, the 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 position of Indonesia is that we are um, putting in place all the the policies uh, that are necessary for uh, a, 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 an energy transition to happen. Uh, but the the devil is in the detail. Uh, so I think uh, this is a very very exciting time. So uh, so we we will have to see. Uh, yeah. The answers, yeah. Thanks very much, Hans. Uh, I'll come to you on further details, especially as Indonesia just hosted the G20 summit. And the, as we probably caught uh, the news on that, they also um, kick-started or launched the energy transition mechanism country platform there. So let's deep dive on that um, in a while. Let's first come to Avril here. Avril, in your um, space or where you work, um, how would you describe the energy landscape in the region? Yeah, um, in in my line of work as um, the deputy of SEED, I think the institution working in the Philippines but also has regional work um, in terms of energy finance and um, dealing with different energy projects and policies in the region. I would say that Southeast Asia is in this critical juncture right now when it comes to the place of change. Just a few years ago, Southeast Asia was dubbed as um, the last bastion of coal, while the rest of the world is divesting from coal and phasing out and not rolling coal projects. Southeast Asia is going against the tide. We have more projects being proposed. But you know, years of opposition and work from communities civil society and people's organizations coming together have brought us to this point where finally the industry is sunsetting. And I do agree with um, the, the other panelists that we are seeing some momentum in the transition. However, there's uh, there are developments in another fossil fuel that is very concerning for us, which is this fossil gas and LNG expansion. We just released a report earlier this year and Two weeks ago at G20 and COP27 on high prices in fossil gas and LNG expansion in the region. And if you look at the pre construction fossil gas power plants in the region, we have now eclipsed East Asia's plans for gas. So we have around 117 gigawatts planned uh, gas fired power plants and 118 LNG terminals that are proposed are already being built. So this is a concern for us because this threatens a detour to our transition. And while we can talk about gas being a bridge fuel and all that, um, just the amount of projects that are being proposed right now would show that this is beyond the bridge and this threatens um, a deeper and a long-term dependence to more fossil fuels. But just on a final note, Despite this massive expansion on gas that we're seeing just this, this past year or so, we are also confronted with this global energy crisis, right? And um, this, this has been happening even before the Russia-Ukraine war, but it's exacerbated now. And this has dire consequences as well, um, not only on um, how 
countries are now reconsidering their policies on promoting gas and LNG, considering unaffordability and supply insecurity, but also revival of plants for coal. That is something that's concerning because if it's not affordable, if there are constraints with supply, then what are the other options? And instead of fast tracking RE, fast tracking or hastening our transition, others are looking back to coal. And quite unfortunately, yesterday we heard of Vietnam releasing a new draft energy plan, which now increases coal consumption. So this is something that is also concerning for us at this point. Thanks so much, Avril, for sharing your insights there, which uh, brings me to my next point, actually. Um, in the face of um, this um, natural gas, which is a fossil gas being um, positioned or framed as a bridge fuel um, necessary for the energy transition. How have you seen um, media organizations, um, nonprofit organizations, and even um, think tanks um, like Ember um, react to um, this narrative that is being forwarded? That's my first question. And follow up to that, how would you wish the energy transition be covered some more by journalists in the region? I guess I'll come to you first, Dr. Yang. Okay, thank, thanks, Ben. And maybe I just quickly share some more my uh, initial thought on your question. Uh, I think uh, we have seen lots of report on clean power transition, not only in Southeast Asia, but many other places around the world. But my feeling is, this is my own observation, I could be wrong, but lots of focus or maybe we say that any electric clean power transition has been framed as a technology substitution or technology termination process. Then many people are talking about phasing down or phasing out coal power and other uh, fossil fuels and replacing them with, with wind and solar and other clean energies. But transforming the power sector or energy sector in general is not simple like this. And we basically need to reconfigure the whole system, not only about the network infrastructure, but also include market mechanisms, regulatory framework, consumer behavior, governance process, and so on. So all constitutive element of the system needs to be adapted for a clean energy future in order to support technology change in the generation mix. So I think now we should probably in, in, in focus more on system configuration rather than confine ourselves to technology termination and uh, substitution. That's one, one observation. Or, um, a, a, another thing is, is you know, this transition has two aspects, basically. One aspect is about phasing down or reduce, reducing the use of fossil fuels for electricity generation. And another side is to promote uptake of their replacement. And uh, so these two aspects go hand in hand. You know, but that's why, you know, I think we should, when we're talking about phasing down fossil fuels, we should make sure, that also make sure that there is enough clean replacement. Otherwise, energy security and affordability will be undermined. And in this context, I think we should really seriously think about what will be the bridge that will link us to a clean energy future. Because I'll just give one example. We all know that variability and intermittency is the key problems for uh, renewable energy, especially during long lasting extreme weather conditions. This is what has happened in China early this year. Extreme drought significantly affect hydro output. And in a hydro dominant province, Sichuan, a hydro output dropped by more than 40%, and no other 
technology can provide a backup to compensate for this sudden reduction in output. And this situation may become more fre um, frequent in the coming years as the climate change become more intensified. So that means that we probably think that rather than think that we just stop all fossil fuels, the first initial step would be how we redefine their role in the power system before they retreat from the whole system. Maybe we should think about demoting them into a supportive role to provide flexibility and backup uh, services to the grid before a complete phase out. That's some of my observations to share with all the uh, audience. Thank you. Thank you so much. Back to you, Ping. Thank you, Dr. Yang. And uh, just before we continue, I'd like to acknowledge um, Nithi Nesadurai from Kanseya, who just tuned in. Nithi, you please um, make yourself comfortable and welcome to the discussion. Um, so just for you to, you know, kind of warm up, uh, I'm now going to turn the time over to Hans first. We're already discussing the energy transition in um, Southeast Asia with a particular focus on um, their reactions from within their spaces of work of how the fossil gas, natural gas is being framed as a bridge uh, to the energy transition. Hans, what's your sense of this? How, how are you as a journalist um, seeing the narratives taking shape in this space? Uh, so if you're asking me about uh, how uh, the, 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 the issue of um, natural gas is being framed in the narrative, it, uh, in my opinion, uh, again, I'm talking about Indonesia here. I don't, I don't see it as something that, that has been pushed um, in narrative, um, I think uh, things that uh, things like um, clean coal technology, like um, um, like coal gasification, and then um, carbon capture storage, that those are the things that are being pushed into the narrative as being, you know, like a like a like a something that could transition us from the dirty coal to clean energy. Um, so I, that's that's uh, my view. Yeah. Thanks very much, Hans. I come to you, Avril, because um, Dr. Yang here um, has given his piece around, you know, the need for it. Um, but also, um, Avril, you've also strongly spoken that, you know, this could be a bridge to nowhere, like the fossil gas, natural gas could be a bridge to nowhere and could actually, um, you know, roll back some gains um, that should have advanced um, renewables. Um, if, if that is a sense that I'm getting, um, Dr. Yang, you can correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, Avril, what's your reaction? I think specifically in the Philippines, what we see is while many of the organizations and communities were focused on battling coal that has been um, the king of Sorry, is it just me or did we lose Avril over there? I, okay. I think I lost her as well. Okay, no worries. I, I let's come to you first, um, Nithi. Um, what is your um, in your in your in the area where you work? Uh, what narratives have you been able to um, observe, um, take traction of how fossil gas is being framed? Yeah, I think we are seeing. Uh, thanks. Um, and I mean, first of all, apologies for joining late. I'm at a parallel meeting here in Bangkok and everywhere I was just speaking, I left and I came and then sorry, it took a while to log on for some reason. But I think that's a very pertinent question. Um, and I think, uh, you know, as Avril was saying, you know, we've been battling against coal and, and suddenly, you know, like through the back door, suddenly now it's fossil gas, you know, um, realizing that coal is, yesterday's um, argument for energy excess and base load and, and and now suddenly they've snuck in fossil gas and I mean see you know where Avril works has been doing tremendous work on um, on highlighting what's happening you know it happening by stealth that how fossil gas is slowly coming in as the transition fuel 
and you know once and you know very quietly with a lot of money and financing many from banks and financial institutions which have signed a pledge not to finance oil and gas anymore doing exactly that and then you know once it sneaks in and once they lock it in we are locked in with it for 40 years you know 30 40 years and uh, which is not going to end well for our governments and this is not happening in a vacuum because if you look at the ASEAN Energy Minister's uh, statement, uh, you know, they had a meeting in September. There were 13 references to gas. And two, let me just take out two statements. They want to have the creation of an enabling environment for sustainable financing in oil and gas. And they want to complement the utilization of natural gas for cleaner energy development. So, you can see what's happening in the big picture here. So we, it's something we have to be very careful because the opportunity costs here are that if they move down the fossil gas pathway, renewable energy solutions will take a back seat. Investments in renewable energy solutions will slow down and it will be they will make it an uneven playing field uh, for renewables. And I, I'm afraid... Um, and that's what we might have to confront in, in, in the future if we allow uh, the fossil gas infrastructure to, to take place. Thanks so much, Niti, for um, your perspectives there. And Avril, if you're ready to share yours, we'll come back to you. Right. Sorry about my, my internet connection. I was saying, um, while many of the groups and organizations were focused on battling coal, unfortunately, the fossil gas industry was able to position themselves as um, a bridge fuel and, and build this narrative that it's a given that they're a bridge without even examining what are the lifespan of these projects, what are the forecasted emissions of methane and other greenhouse gases, and what are the impacts to biodiversity and other um, you know, important concerns, right? Um, and, and this is something that we are now um, diligently fighting against um, um, breaking down this this narrative and challenging it and and looking at other factors before we say blankly and, and accept it um, um as if it's a given that this is a bridge we will right without considering whether it will bring us closer to our climate goals or will actually pose a detour and we're happy to see that other communities and organizations in other parts of southeast asia are starting to take strong positions against the expansion uh, happening in the region. So we're hearing from communities in Bali, Indonesia, standing up against projects there. And we hope to hear more organizations speaking out and challenging this position of, of the industry that it's um, a given fuel to this transition, a, a bridge. Thank you. Thank you, Avril, for that. I understand that, Avril, you'll need to log off um, at 2 p.m. So while we um, have you, I'll just uh, throw in as much questions as I could. Um, so my, my next question is, as I recognize that there are um, over 20 uh, participants here who might be themselves journalists. So in your areas where you work, how do you think journalists should be covering the climate or um, the energy transition story in the region through the climate lens. And why is this important? I mean, just to give you a context, at Eco Business, we strongly see the nexus of business, the business case of the energy transition, but also um, there is the climate lens through which to see this transition that is happening. Why do you think this is important? And how do you think journalists should cover the energy transition through the climate lens? Maybe I'll um, give the floor to Hans here first. Uh, sure. Uh, so uh, I think it's really important. As you mentioned, um, I think it's really important um, for um, journalists to, you know, to not um, fall into the trap of dichotomy because that, that's what I've been seeing in my um, in my career as a journalist. I, I've seen a lot of my uh, fellow journalists. Uh, saying that oh I'm not an environmental journalist so I, why should I you know write something about the environment uh, even though like they're writing about um, energy about um, palm oil about all these things that are really closely related to the environment so I think it's 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 really a pity because I think um, if you're looking at the newsroom um, 
I think it's it's still uh, it's still being um, segregated. Uh, like we have all these different desks. Uh, like we have politic desks. We have um, uh, criminal desks. Uh, so there. So uh, eventually, um, the journalists they themselves they also fall into this trap, right? So they 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 are afraid that oh uh, because there's already uh, other people who write about environment, so I I shouldn't you know bother them. I shouldn't uh, you know. Uh, uh, include the environmental context into my writing so i think that's that's uh that's something that uh we have to work on uh we need to realize that um that you know uh, uh the issue of climate change uh is something that's you know permeates uh, all of these uh, uh the aspects of our lives so i think uh the the change has to happen from within uh, the newsroom itself uh because otherwise, uh, the journalists they won't, you know, they they will still um, separate themselves. Yeah, I think that's my take uh, on that question. I agree with you, Hans. That you know, um, covering the clim climate change is actually uh, touches upon a lot of themes, um, and later on we'll deep dive on that as well. Um, to the point that Dr. Yang said that this is a systemic transition that we're doing. We cannot just isolate the conversation just by focusing on perhaps technology. Um, Nifi, what is your take on that? Why is it so important for journalists in the region uh, to cover the energy transition through the climate lens? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. That's a very well uh, put thing. And they should climate uh, cover it through the climate lens simply because of the impacts which are already happening you know for journalists you always want to get to the people right what are people feeling and the way you know the climate lens will actually show the impacts which are already real and happening now um, on communities frontline communities which are feeling the brunt of climate change especially in the form of loss and damage because of climate-induced displacement. We have plenty of examples, you know, uh, from, from Haiyan to, to the floods in, in, in many countries uh, in, in the region. Now it's almost a daily occurrence and the suffering which goes with such people. So, you know, taking the human element is the way to cover it. And then, so we know the consequences of climate change and those who are the vulnerable, the marginalized are the ones who face the brunt of it. And in a way, they are the ones who are the most powerless. So it's good to get their voices. Now, so when you find those, the victims of the consequences of, consequences of climate change, then we look at who is causing the climate change. And it's actually, or what is causing climate change? And it's fossil fuels. And, you know, where a few corporations basically dominate the space and make, you know, obscene profits and that if we are going to continue with this fossil gas pipeline it's just going to get worse so you know that's you know so it's a forewarning so i would that's how i would argue like journalists covering from the human angle that the suffering we are already encountering encountering now uh, which is terrible you know which is affecting tens of millions of people and already leading to climate displacement will only get worse if you continue with, you know, um, setting up new fossil gas pipelines. And the, the second point I'd like to make is also that, you know, if the industrialized countries uh, phase out fossil fuels or transition away from fossil fuels, it's going to cost our region, uh, you know, in terms of uh, tariffs and barriers and the carbon border adjustment mechanism, where, you know, we continue, we have been, you know, heavily reliant on, on uh, fossil fuels for the, to, to meet the electricity demand and the energy demand in our region. And if we continue to do so, uh, even though the financing is coming from those very own countries, we might be penalized down the road to say that you are too carbon intensive, we're going to in, impose tariffs on you. So that's a, 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 f a further warning down the road if we continue on this path. Very well said, Nithi. I'm aware of your timing, Avril. I'll give the floor to you first before I call Dr. Yang. Um, yeah, I think Climate Tracker released a very interesting study last year um, where it found that the more coal dependent the country is in Southeast Asia, the more favorable the press coverage is when it comes to coal. 
with the Philippines as an outlier. I think that highlights the importance of having this climate lens when it comes to covering the energy, uh, where energy issues and the energy transition in the region. Because as Niki said, you know, we know that energy is a main culprit to this climate crisis. And being able to show that climate lens will challenge this type of press coverage that's very favorable to this um, to this industry that's worsening the climate crisis. On how we want journalists to cover um, these types of stories, we def I definitely second meet me on um, primarily highlighting pe the the stories of the people. These are um, often the the most impacted are those who have the least access to their stories being told and being heard. So we, we hope more journalists put in um, this, this time to cover their stories, but also um, highlighting the science because the science is clear, but unfortunately it's something that's not that accessible to a lot. And it's not something that as laymanized or as easy to understand for, for many. So having journalists um, simplify that and connect the dots between stories on the ground and what the experts and scientists are saying um, would be very much um, helpful in, in this cause that we're trying to push. Thanks very much, Avril. And Dr. Yang, may I turn to you for your thoughts? Um, why do you think it is very important for journalists to cover the energy transition in Southeast Asia through the climate lens? Well, because you know, we I think it, it is now well established that you know we and the world is not moving in a way that is going to be sustainable. And why? Because there is an imbalance between our human system and the natural environment. And the, and because of this, one of the symptoms is climate change and there's so many other environmental issues. And to fix them, we need to rebalance our human lives with the environment. And that's why that's the that's why that's how we become more sustainable, and that's how we achieve sustainable development over the long run. And the energy sector is the main contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. That's why it's very important for journalists to look at transitions from a climate perspective. Because to make it clean and reliable would be the key drivers for its future development. That's one thing. Another thing I want to highlight here is that I think my view is that generally should or may like to consider unpacking the complexity involved in this transition. Otherwise, People may people may not necessarily know that how difficult that would be, because people you know for us to come up with better solutions, the first step is that we should develop understanding of the complexities and difficulties involved, and then people start discuss those, uh, those complex issues and debating with each other, and then this will ultimately lead to a better solution. But the first step is that. People need to understand what is needed, what the transition will entail, rather than saying that this is just simply about building more wind and solar or just phasing down fossil fuels. It's not that straightforward. Yeah, that's my view. Thanks. Back to Thanks, you, Thanks, Dr. Yang. You spotlighted that very well, that the technical aspect of the transition is really important to articulate. And many times, because of course, there's limited media space and limited resources and really small newsrooms dedicating resources to this, it almost does not get the, the attention, the importance that it really deserves. Um, I'll give the uh, turn to um, Hans to being the journalist here and the Climate Tracker Fellow. Of course, as I mentioned earlier, Bali came from a G20 summit where um, the Indonesian government launched the energy transition mechanism. Now, I'm um, taking that as a case study um, and citing the importance of, you know, reporting energy stories through the climate lens. How would you perhaps as a journalist approach this um, story, it, it's obviously a policy story. It's also an economic um, story, you know, uh, but, but 
as we mentioned, the frame, uh, framing it according to the climate change um, is really important for us. Um, and and it is, I'm asking this for the benefit as well of the journalists um, who are probably tuned in today. So Hans, what's your take? Uh, yeah, I think as you mentioned, uh, it, it is really important to you know to to cover these uh, these uh, policy stories uh, from a climate lens. Um, I think it's it's really important uh, to uh, to include the the the, the perspective of uh, communities that would be impacted by these uh, policies by this energy transition. Uh, what does it mean for them? For our you know for our um, neighbors who are living, for example, uh, around uh, coal power plants, uh, if they're being shut down, uh, what uh, what will happen to them? Uh, will they lose their jobs? And then what what are needed uh, in order to for them to to uh, secure their livelihoods? Uh, but also, what are the benefit, benefits and, uh, for them? Uh, let's say uh, we have a case study where uh, we see uh, people who have been uh, living for more than ten years uh, near a coal power plant, and then they've been uh, suffer they've been suffering from uh, respir respiratory problems. So uh, I think that will uh, that will bring uh, present a case uh, for the retirement of this coal power plant. So I think uh, looking from the human perspective, uh, what does it mean to have this policy implemented uh, for the communities? Uh, is really important. Wonderful. And I want to thank, say thank you, Avril, as well, for staying on. Uh, with my eye on the time, I just want to acknowledge Samrat Silwal, who dropped in a question for us. But this is more for the Climate Tracker team. Uh, Samrat is writing from Kathmandu, and he said that he would really love to be able to cover um, stories like this uh, on science and climate change in the context of the Himalayas. And he'd like to reach out to Climate Tracker, I guess, uh, for support um, to cover the topic through documentaries and articles. So, Samrat, if you're tuned in still, I'll leave the Climate Tracker team to respond to um, your question here. Um, that being said, and with my eye on the time, I'd like to ask one question wrap uh, for all our panelists here. There has been a criticism on uh, journalism that focuses on the um, doom of climate change and at the same time on journalism that kind of highlights the solutions around the climate crisis that is already affecting us all. Um, Nithi, Dr. Young, Hans, and Avril, if you're still in the call, what is your take um, in terms of uh, journalism that will really cover the energy transition? Is it going to be a heartening, inspiring story? Is it going to be a story about the many dangers of climate change or a bit of both? Your last shots, please. Maybe I'll, I'll go first, Ping. Um, I think, yeah, I agree that we need to focus on the, on the solutions and how uh, sort of multi-stakeholder participation is the key uh, towards, um, you know, uh, getting, creating the world we want. And again, you know, it, it, it's a, it's a negative, negative scenario. Like, for instance, when you talk about solutions, the Department of Energy of the Philippines has approved 42 offshore wind contracts with a combined capacity of 31,000 megawatts. And, you know, so the Philippines has the capacity to generate about 40 gigawatts. Sorry for throwing in all this jargon from offshore wind, which actually negates the need to have any existing, you know, can phase out the existing coal and fossil gas pipeline. So the question is, so Philippines has done that. Why aren't other countries which also have this renewable energy potential doing so? Uh, and instead from again, you know, quoting from the uh, ASEAN energy ministers meeting, coming up with all kinds of false, false solutions like uh, low carbon technology systems, uh, ammonia, uh, hydrogen, small modular reactors, 13 references to civilian nuclear energy. I think we've got a question as to when there are positive solutions which will you know, provide access to, to energy and as well as keep our emissions low. Why are we moving in this opposite direction? You know? So while it's, there are positive solutions, the general situation is not a happy one.
Very well Hi. said, Niffy. Um, Avril, would you like to be next to weigh in? Yes, because I, I, I would have to go after this. Um, I, I think the, the coverage should, should include, you know, all the multifaceted issues that um, are, are involved in, in this energy transition. And the discussions range from high level policy to the technical discussions, to the science, and then of course the very real um, lived realities of communities on the ground and the groups and uh, communities that continue to challenge massive uh, fossil fuels expansion that's still happening despite this kind of crisis to, to finally the, the impacts, right? That's happening not only in, um, from, from the worsening climate crisis, but what are the impacts on the pockets of ordinary people? How much are power rates now? How much are other basic commodities that are also affected by this global energy crisis? so that the people could understand that this is not a matter of just climate, or this is not just a matter of power, but these are actually issues that are interconnected and would have would need the systemic, multifaceted and multi-sectoral solutions to address. And, and I hope we continue to have this. This is something that we're seeing in, in a lot of the different coverages um, of, of the issue. And, and I hope that we continue to see this in the years to come as we're confronted with evolving challenges, but also growing number of solutions. Thank you very much. I'll call on Dr. Young first before Hans gives us his parting shots. Okay, thank you. Uh, just quickly share some of my thought on this. I, I, my view is that the discussion so far has been revol mainly revolving around raising climate ambitions. And, uh, but now I think ambitions will not lead to actual reductions in emissions, but only action can. That's why I would say that now we should put more emphasis on actions because this, not only because this will reduce emissions, but also that this will create a positive feedback loop that create more man momentum that will ultimately lead to more ambitious commitments towards emissions reduction. That's one thing. Another thing I want to say here is that, you know, maybe we should think of a way to align the interests of fossil fuel companies with clean power transition. Find a way to incentivize them to act on reducing their own carbon footprint. Some actions has, has already been undertaken like ESG and, and some others, but more effort are still needed because we should not consider this as a zero thumb game. We should have them, the first of few companies on our side to transform themselves because they have the money, they have the capacity, they have the technology know-how. And so if we can align their interests with the clean energy future, I think then we can act faster, and uh, you know we can still make 1.5 degree within reach. Thanks. Back to you, Ping. Very well said, Dr. Yang. It really is important for us to make the science communication and action align. Thank you. And uh, last but not least, Hans, is it the climate doom and, or the climate gloom or the climate solution story that we want to highlight as a journalist? Um, I think it's really important uh, as a journalist to uh, to not only uh, report about the problems but also offer solutions. Uh, something that we we know uh, as uh, social journalism. But unfortunately, I think we as we, are, we as journalists uh, we tend to uh, follow uh, the the bad news because there, there's this mindset that uh, only bad news sells, right? But uh, based on my experience and uh, uh, on the, the, the publication that I'm working on, Manga Bay, uh, apparently uh, readers, they are more engaged uh, when they read uh, positive news, uh, when, they, when the news that they, they read also, also offer solutions so that uh, they, they, they know that there's something that they, they can do, do about, uh, not only uh, being trapped on, in all of these problems. So, um, I think we, we have to change our mindset as journalists. Uh, uh, we have to realize that it is actually better for us to, uh, you know, to, uh, to, to focus on the solutions rather than the problems. Um, but 
I think it's going to be a challenge because we are not used to it. I mean, I personally, I'm not used to it. Uh, I, I still have this tendency to uh, to focus on the problems. Uh, it's going to be a challenge. And uh, there's also a possibility of uh, us writing about a uh, false solution. Like it, it's it's going to be a, a, an issue uh, for us in, in the future. Uh, so we, we have to be more cautious about uh, a false solution and also uh, greenwashing from um, companies. Very well said. And with that, I'm afraid that that is all the time that we have for our session. I would like to thank you, Hans, um, Dr. Yang, Nithi, and Avril for engaging with me and our um, participants and joiners in this uh, very important session, Storytelling Through the Climate Lens on Southeast Asia's Energy Transition. This has been Ping Manongdo, and thank you once again for engaging with me. Back to you, the Climate Tracker team. Thank you all. We empower and connect environmental journalists, newsrooms, and NGOs around the world. Join our growing network, climatetracker.org.